Thank you very much. 30 years ago, I was preparing for finals, and a water cycle was on my mind, but I never thought I would work in water. Yet, in 1989, I was at a bank, and I was assigned to cover water companies around Britain, and then Europe, and the world. And in the last 20 years, I've moved from being a banker to a consultant. Um, the first thing you learn when you're looking at an investment is that if something needs to be done, it ought to be done. You think about mobile phones or something like that. People will spend money on what needs to be done. That's not the case in water. I have a vision one day that northern Pakistan, India, Egypt will have water and sanitation. If they don't today, they did 4,000 years ago. The Indus Valley culture had household sanitation. Egypt and, in, and uh, the Vedic India had quite advanced filtration systems. What have we lost in the last 4,000 years? Why are we waiting? Well, first of all, context. A water cycle is an extraordinary thing. It takes seawater, it distills it for nothing. The rivers, it pipes it to where we need. Water is held in lakes, in the soil, in marshes, and those marshes, animals and plants that live in them and bacteria treat the water. UV, seawater, treats the water. A vast cycle of pro providing water for us. And water on the surface is abundant. Of every raindrop that we need, which flows from the rivers, another 150 falls onto the land. The trouble is, we have a, water has a habit of flowing on the wrong place at the wrong time. 42,500 cubic kilometers of water go down the world's rivers. Unfortunately, half of that goes down at the time of floods and monsoons, so that's not much use. Another quarter of that flows down rivers such as the Congo, the Amazon, and in northern Europe and America, where there's no one there to pick it up. And what's left over, we already use 20% of it. So, in agriculture, industry, and municipal use. So what ought to be abundant is not. Now, for the first time in human history, we live in an urban world. Last year, 50% of people lived in urban areas. The scale of that urbanization hasn't really been appreciated yet. Between 1950 and 2050, the number of people living in urban areas in Africa is growing by 39-fold. 3.4 billion people in urban areas in Asia by 2050. But at the same time, this means we have pressures pressures we've never had in, in the past. Think about the pressures on the human footprint, water having to be abs abstracted from a wider and a wider area to feed cities. The impact of pollution goes wider and wider, and those cities manipulate the water cycle in detrimental matters, all of which is being exacerbated by climate change. Outside this room, there is supposedly a debate on climate change. We have not had a debate on climate change in the water industry for 10 years. We've been too busy dealing with it. It's here, it's now, it's making life hard for us all. Well, water scarcity actually has been around with us for some time. You look at the future, go back to the past. Angkor Wat, the classic mayor in, Malaysia, in Mexico, those cities and civilizations rose with water. They fell when water supplies ran out or were mismanaged. It can happen again. It can happen again because of population growth. By 2030, 3.9 billion people will live in areas of extreme water stress, and it's not evenly spread. In the OECD, the advanced countries, 38% of people will live in extreme water stress. In Russia, India, China, and Brazil, the fastest growing populations, the fastest growing economies, 62% of people living in the threat of extreme water stress. And the problem about this is resilience. If you have resilience, you can deal with it. If you've got the infrastructure and the management, you can deal with it. A paper in Nature last year pointed out that in the developed economies, 90% of the 
of the land area water resources was threatened by biodiversity loss and threatened by availability loss. But because of the trillions of dollars we have spent on infrastructure, just 5% of it is actually vulnerable. In contrast, you look at the world's poorest economies, just 43% of their water resources are under threat. But once you factored in their absence of infrastructure spending, that 43% rose to 96. It's not an attractive future. I believe the real reason why we are in all this trouble is because we don't value water. One of the most extreme cases is Saudi Arabia, where the average water bill covers 10% of their operating costs. What does that result in? Right, they get their water through distillation, the most expensive and most energy intensive way of desalinating water. It goes in a pipe 200 kilometers to Raida. Now, you would think at that stage they would take it seriously. They'd manage it well. Nope, 39% of it is lost in leaks because a large proportion of people living in the city don't have basic water or basic sewerage, that means that the groundwater is contaminated with excreta, which goes into the pipes. That's what happens when you don't value water. If you don't value water in India, that is why not a single major city in India has 24-hour water availability. And even when we do value water, we are in all sorts of trouble. England and Wales arguably have some of the world's best managed water. You might not believe it, but it is the case. What's happened in the last 20 years? 84 billion pounds has been spent on infrastructure. But because we've got more infrastructure, because we're pumping more, we're treating more, the energy use in the water sector has gone up 113%. The sector is more efficient than it ever has been. A fifth of operating costs have been taken up but water bills have still risen 45% ahead of inflation. God help us in the next 20 years. Can we rethink the water cycle? I think a good pointer here is Singapore. When Singapore became independent 50 years ago, it was exposed to drought. It was entirely dependent on Malaysia for imported water resources. And if you weren't rich, you had no sanitation whatsoever. Today, water comes in from desalination, the most effective, energy efficient forms of desalination. Everybody is connected to water, wastewater, wastewater efficiency, water metering, water treatment, wastewater treatment. The entire Ireland is operated as a catchment. It means that the surfaces are clean, the water resources are clean so that they can be mobilized for use whenever they need to be. All that wastewater which is treated, an increasing proportion of it is now put back into wastewater recovery. Full cost recovery, because they pay, everyone pays what they need to for the water, it means they can invest in sustainable water, they value water, they manage it. And by 2061, an island state is going to become self-sufficient in water. What we need to do is to recognise what ecosystem services, nature does for us for free. A paper by Constanza, 15 years ago nearly, in Nature, pointed out that while the human economy worldwide is worth $18 trillion, nature provides services to us for nothing worth 33. Three billion trillion of that coming from the water sector alone, which is a factor more than is paid for water around the world. I think the simplest analogy would be, what would happen if we didn't have rainfall? Well, using the cheapest techniques we've got today, just to take the water which runs down our rivers, would cost more than the entire cost of the human economy to desalinate. So I think it's worthwhile valuing nature. Give you a couple of examples of full cost resolve recovery. In Chile, it was used to transform the water sector more than a decade ago. As a result, they have universal wastewater treatment and services. But people said, can we afford it? The trick they played here was when the utilities became profitable, the government retained major shareholdings in all of them. Those shareholdings, the dividends from, are now used to subsidize the poor. 
So it's not only universally available, it's universally affordable. They bought people into it. In Manila, for 130 years, the utility there served to serve the rich, to serve its staff, to serve its politicians. If you lived in a slum area, you didn't vote, and therefore you didn't get water. 1997, the sector was reformed. Until then, 62% of Manila's water either was lost in leakage or was never billed for because it didn't matter, no one cared. Today, just 12% of water is wasted. More to the point, the number of people served by the utility has increased fourfold. More to the point, from no slum dwellers having access to water, today 1.6 million in one part of Manila alone have access. The company has been transformed. It serves people, not politicians. Closer to home, 10 years ago, Welsh Water, one of the privatised water companies in Britain, was close to bankruptcy. It was taken over by Glass Cymru. Glass Cymru was a not-for-profit vehicle designed to make water cheaper and more affordable and more efficiently run. It refinanced the entire company to cut the cost of debt, got rid of its dividends, got rid of the expensive elements. It outsourced anything it wasn't good at to people who were better at. As a result, in the last decade, it's the only water company in Britain which has done distressingly cuts in its bills, making a poor area like Wales more affordable compared with the rest of Britain. From problems and solutions, we need to go to visions. Forget what can't be done about water. It's what can and must be done. We should, in a proper world, fund universal water and sanitation. That isn't that what overseas aid is all about. But, as I think everyone in this room knows, it's much, much more attractive and sexy to give overseas aid in the form of cluster bombs and telecoms and glamorous things like that. Water isn't exciting. That's why we neglect it so systemically. It's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. We have to acknowledge that every country in the world, ultimately, is going to have to be financially self-sufficient in water. That means bringing about the universal notion, full cost recovery for everybody, financial self-sufficiency, financial honesty and efficiency. Water is a good business. If it's properly managed, it can attract funding and go forward. We need to be innovative. There have been some very corrosive debates in recent years about the human right to water. The problem with this is one side of the debate says that water should be free, which is fantastic. And why don't we have some dysentery and cholera? Well, what's the problem with that? Well, I will give you one number. It's called a disability adjusted life year. Forget all the numbers about lack of access to water and sanitation. Forget all the deaths. One in every 13 people spends the equivalent of every year too ill to work or to function as a normal human being. What a waste of life, what a waste of opportunity, what a waste of human dignity. That's what happens when water is free. It's not free, it costs much, much more with knobs on. Instead, we should move the debate on to an access to affordable water, access to sustainable water, access to properly managed water. At the same time, we need to factor in the human factor. Uh, one of the problems with econ econ economics sometimes is they try to model everything. This is great, but to give you an example, in Tunis, in Morocco, a scheme was produced to encourage people in a poor area where safe water was available at the street level but not at the household level to have household connections. They paid the full price for connection to water they paid the full price for the water, but they were given subsidies to make the connection fee more affordable in terms of finance. The assumption was that everyone would do this, they would save time, and of course they would save that time by working harder and longer. Nope, almost universally, everybody who saved between 15 and 40 minutes a day, they spent it resting, talking, reading, going out. They spent it being human beings. So. When modelling, when forecasting, when wondering what fits into what, put in the human factor. Sometimes it gives us joy. But we need 
new technologies. We need to do more, better, cheaper. We live in a golden age of innovation. You would be astonished at what's coming through the pipeline. Harvesting water from the air, carbon neutral desalination, rainwater, grey water, worth water recovery, chlorine free treatments, smart metering and monitoring, and efficient irrigation. But there is a bottleneck. The will to finance these technologies is weak. There's an aridity of early stage funding. There are deserts when it comes to venture capital. Lack of interest, lack of engagement, and a dearth of mentoring and support for these companies. They are going to the wall because they're not being supported. We, at the same time, we need to have innovative management. We need to understand that things can be done better. Forget pride, engage. There is so much to learn from other companies, so many incremental improvements which can be knitted together to the better good rather than taking whole scale approaches. Ultimately, this boils down to shifting our attitudes from supply management to demand management. Supply management means the customer uses as much water as they like and you just shove the water down the line to them. Demand management means actually saying, that's not sustainable. How can we encourage the customer to do what they want with less. It's a whole different approach. It's also a sustainable one. We need three revolutions, a blue revolution of rainwater harvesting and demand management. We need a gray revolution, whereby things like bath water is recycled. We need a brown revolution. The brown revolution is about taking the value in wastewater, its energy, its nutrients, its water, and mobilizing it. We need to winnow away the appalling losses of corruption and mismanagement. Some countries where water is, and funding is short, 40% of money goes in corruption, not in providing a service. By sharing information, by finding out areas of inefficiency, we can grind away at corruption. To this end, I want to urge people to value water, value the water cycle, be open, about what we can do with it, sharing information, sharing innovation, sharing ways of pushing forward efficiency and demand management. Believe in the, not just the possibility, but the necessity of universal access to water and sanitation. It's not just about being nice, it's not just about human rights, it's good business. So instead of working against the workers water cycle, work with it, mimic it, value it, Believe in the water cycle. Humanity can survive and thrive if we accept its values. Thank you.